It's early October in 1999, and NASA's entire network has just been shut down in their headquarters in Washington, D.C. Why? Because of a 15-year-old boy who had just downloaded $1.7 million worth of data. He hijacked 13 computers, intercepted over 3,000 messages, and even hacked the International Space Station. But how did an average teenager by the name of Jonathan James even achieve this? And why did he choose to become one of the most wanted criminals in the world? Well, let me take you back to 1983. Jonathan was born on December 12th in Pinecrest, Florida. His father was a computer programmer and his mother was a stay-at-home mom. Jonathan, who was introduced to computers at the young age of six, heard the same complaints that we all did. His parents believed that he was spending too much time playing video games, and thus, they tried to limit his access to consoles and the family computer. Little did they know that this would backfire with a mind that saw no problem in breaking the rules. Jonathan looked for a way to bypass those limitations. Moving on from just innocent video games, he shocked his father with his developing skills in computer programming by changing the operating system of his dad's PC into Linux. This was the turning point for Jonathan, because he realized he could do much more than just leveling up in games. As Jonathan neared adulthood, his fascination with computers only grew stronger, becoming more of an obsession. Faced with his destructive passion, his parents decided to intervene the only way they thought possible. They took his computer away, hoping to fix his excessive use. This action, however, wasn't new. They had tried limiting his computer time before. This time, Jonathan's reaction was beyond furious. Feeling misunderstood, he made the drastic decision to leave home. He defended his computer use with a strong argument. It never interfered with his academics. In fact, he boasted about doing well in school, suggesting that his computer time wasn't a problem. But there was a secret behind his good grades. Jonathan wasn't just studying harder, he had taken a darker route. With skills far beyond his years, at just 13, he managed to hack into the networks of several schools around Miami. Once inside, he altered his grades in the reports, painting a picture of academic excellence that wasn't earned through traditional hard work. With these talents at such a young age, he joined a hacking community and started to call himself Comrade in his online chats. After talking with a few of these hacker members, they saw his potential and helped him in improving his hacking skills. After his first few successes at hacking schools, he decided it was time to move on to bigger targets. With his experience in school networks, he wanted to go after more powerful educational institutions like Cornell, Stanford, and Harvard. But Jonathan quickly got tired of hacking schools. His aims were set higher, much higher. So it was finally time to put his skills to the test. At 15, his next prey was one of the largest telecommunication companies in the US, AT&T Bell South. However, hacking into AT&T was just a trial run, a learning process to see if he could actually do it. He left the company's servers undamaged, and there was no reported loss of data. Jonathan wasn't seeking the company data, he just did it because he could, and nobody would ever stop him. His ego and pride were highly accepted by his community, but this still wasn't enough for this obsessed 15-year-old. Between August and October in 1999, Jonathan decided to set his target on one of the most powerful government institutions of the US. It was at this time that Jonathan got a hold of a vulnerable NASA server in Alabama. He'd spend days bypassing their firewalls and was able to install malware on them. Soon enough, he had gotten access to the system and could now control 13 computers on the company's network. This small unit was where the International Space Station's communication systems and rocket engines were developed and tested. Jonathan downloaded the source code of NASA software that was responsible for elements that were crucial to life support in space. The code, worth about $1.7 million, controlled the physical environment like temperature and humidity in the living areas of the International Space Station. When NASA security experts found out about the exploit, they were forced to go into lockdown for the next three weeks. They spent $41,000 to analyze the source of the attack and repair the server and every compromised machine. Meanwhile, Jonathan already shifted his focus to another target, the Department of Defense. This time, he penetrated the division within the DoD that was responsible for monitoring and assessing potential threats to the USA. 
Jonathan used his advanced hacking skills to secretly install a backdoor on a server. This sensitive entry point was more than just a breach. It was a gateway that gave him complete access to the agency's core. He installed a sophisticated sniffing program that quietly lurked within the server, capturing the flow of network traffic. This digital dragnet intercepted a lot of sensitive communications, capturing over 3,300 emails exchanged between DoD employees, as well as their carefully guarded usernames and passwords. This complex cyber attack was a historic first, a successful breach of the internal networks of a Pentagon's external unit. Jonathan's actions not only breached the agency's digital walls, but also broke the illusion of impenetrability that surrounded one of the nation's most secure agencies. However successful it was, this marked the beginning of the end for Jonathan. The breach of the Department of Defense was the final act that drew the intense investigation of the federal government, a key player in national defense. The thought that a teenager could infiltrate such a critical institution and escape unpunished was impossible. On January 26, 2000, defense agents arrested Jonathan at his home, seizing four PCs, a laptop, and his mobile phone. This incident occurred during the internet's early days, a time when the legal framework around computer crimes was still forming. Being a minor, Jonathan faced a different legal process than an adult who would have risked at least a decade in prison and multiple fines. In court, 16-year-old Jonathan faced charges of juvenile delinquency. He pled guilty, acknowledging his involvement in the breaches. His sentence? Six months of house arrest, during which he was to write apology letters to NASA and the DoD. He was also forbidden from using computers for anything but educational purposes. His case marked the first instance of a juvenile receiving a federal sentence for computer hacking. He actively cooperated with the investigators and detailed how he hacked his targets. But he didn't cause any damage since he didn't run viruses, delete files, or change passwords. Jonathan was lucky that the court judges were easy on him, with only six months of house arrest. However, Jonathan later violated his house arrest and by drug use discovered through blood tests led to a harder punishment. The court revoked his initial sentence and ordered him to spend six months in a juvenile correctional facility, marking a historic moment as he became the first teenager in the US to be imprisoned for a computer-related offense. These sanctions skyrocketed his popularity nationwide, and he quickly got a lot of attention. The media wanted interviews, and Jonathan felt the need to give his side of the story. He shared why he got into hacking, saying it was for fun and he wanted to feel powerful, like many people do. He criticized the government for not protecting their computer networks better. Jonathan admitted he downloaded some code because he was curious, not to cause trouble. He thought that the code wasn't even that valuable. He was surprised when agents raided his home and said he had tried to help by telling the institutions he hacked about their security problems, but no one listened to him. He believed a friend might have told the authorities about him. When he found out from his dad that he was going to be arrested, he was in Israel and couldn't believe it. Jonathan insisted he wasn't doing anything really wrong, just exploring. He realized that government computers were not very secure. He didn't try to hide his hacks because he didn't think it was a big deal. But he would stop hacking even though he enjoyed it like playing video games. After all this, Jonathan wanted to start his own computer security company to help protect against hackers. After this interview, he was sent to jail for the full six months. After his release, he hid from media attention and went back to his parents' home. Forwarding to January 2007, the Secret Service showed up at Jonathan's house because they thought he was involved in another hacking incident. In 2007, during a big hacking event that hit TJX and other companies, Jonathan's name came up again. Albert Gonzalez was leading a group that broke into the systems of companies like TJX and stole lots of credit card information. Jonathan got mixed up in this because some of his online friends and other hackers were part of Gonzalez's group. When these hackers were caught and questioned, they mentioned knowing Jonathan. Because Jonathan was already well known, he became a main target for the investigation. But simply suspecting Jonathan wasn't enough for a raid, was it? Investigators found out that someone called JJ was working with Gonzalez. They thought JJ might stand for Jonathan James. 
That was all the Secret Service needed to get a warrant and raid Jonathan's place, as well as his brother's and girlfriend's home. During the raid, they made a surprising find, a gun and a suicide note from an earlier time Jonathan had considered suicide. Throughout this time, Jonathan said he had nothing to do with any hacking group, and he was telling the truth. After looking into it, the agents couldn't find any real proof linking him to the crimes, just the JJ initials. Plus, his gun was legally owned. Because of this, they had to drop their case against him. Later, they found out that JJ was actually someone else, Stephen Watts, known online as Jim Jones. This unfair treatment deeply affected Jonathan, leading him to a tragic decision. On May 18, 2008, Jonathan, only 24 and battling depression, ended his life. He was found in the shower with a shotgun and a suicide note. This note included his PayPal and other account passwords. In his note, Jonathan wrote, I do not believe in our justice system. Perhaps my actions today and this letter will be a serious signal to the public but I have lost control of the situation and this is my only way to fix it. To be honest, I have nothing to do with this whole TJX story. Even though Chris Scott and Albert Gonzalez are the most dangerous and destructive hackers the feds have ever caught, I am far more seductive as a victim to public opinion than those two random idiots. That is life. Remember, it's not that you win or lose, but that I personally win or lose by being in prison for 20, 10, or even 5 years for a crime that I didn't commit. This is my way of winning, but at least I'll die free. After his death, some people thought there was more to the story. They suspected a cover-up, believing Jonathan might have found very sensitive information during his hacks into NASA and the Pentagon. We'll never know all the details that Jonathan found. Despite his talents, Jonathan's story takes a tragic ending. This was the story of Comrade, the young, obsessive mastermind behind some of the most impressive hacks. For more stories, make sure to subscribe.